Don't forget, you can reach the latest episode of Potomac Watch anytime. Just ask your smart speaker, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. That is, play the opinion Potomac Watch podcast. From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo here on Potomac Watch with Mary O'Grady and Joe Sternberg. And let's listen to Jay Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, who announced the standing pat on interest rates in its July meeting last week. Let's listen to his explanation. Today, the FOMC decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. We are maintaining our restrictive stance of monetary policy in order to keep demand in line with supply and reduce inflationary pressures. The question will be whether the totality of the data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks are consistent with rising confidence on inflation and maintaining a solid labor market. If that test is met, a reduction in our policy rate could be on the table as soon as the next meeting in September. So you asked why not today? Uh, And I would just say, again, that the broad sense of the committee is that we're getting closer to the point at which it will be appropriate to reduce our policy rate, but that we're not quite at that point yet. So he held fast, and the market seemed to like it for the first day or two days last week. And then when the jobs report came out, they were not so pleased. But now, of course, we have scapegoat hunting, and the usual suspects on Wall Street and in Washington are saying, Jay Powell, why didn't you cut in July? It would have helped us. Personally, I think a 25 basis points cut in July would not have made much difference. And in fact, he did signal that rate cuts are coming as early as September and probably more in the other years. But did he make a mistake last week? And should he now have an emergency rate cut of 50 basis points or more as some people are saying? Well, Paul, I think it's absolutely ridiculous for a lot of these um I don't know. You play football. Isn't there like a Monday morning guy who Quarterback. Says, it's called oh, the yeah, Monday morning right. quarterback. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Commenting uh, on the Sunday game that you didn't play. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you have people saying that he should have cut in July. These are the same people who have been saying he should have cut for the last year. You know, if they were in charge, I don't think he would have ever gotten inflation under control. The tools that the Fed has are very backward looking. It's absolutely impossible for him to be right on the dime with the cuts because he's looking at the data that he has available to him, which is what the economy did in the past. So is he late? Probably. But as you say, I mean, a quarter of a point in July probably would not have made such a big difference. They're a little bit worried about that idea of inflation resurging again. The spendaholics in the government have not helped them. But now I think they will probably, I'm guessing, stay on course because I think the worst thing they could do is sort of this panic, you know, 50 basis points cut. This is the, you know, stop, go Fed policy that's really very damaging to the economy. So they should stay where they are come down 25 basis points. And as Joe says, he makes the right point. We need people on the other institution in Congress and the executive to basically begin to give us some pro-growth policies. And they don't want to do that. Neither side really wants to do that. Well, they're willing to spend, but they're not willing to do anything else. So commenting on the Fed, Joe, I mean, I think if you look back here, seven, eight months back to December, Powell began to signal easier money to the markets. He was saying, you know, we're looking at in their dot plots that they come out with in the quarterly meetings, the Fed officials, they indicate where they think interest rates are going, where they think the economy is going. And in December, they were signaling with those dot plots and with some of Powell's rhetoric that they were going to have two, three interest rate cuts across this year. Stocks took off. I mean, you had a huge increase in asset values after that. And that was, in a way, a rate cut, okay? That got an abrupt reality check when inflation in the first quarter was stronger than the Fed had expected. So they slowed that down and pulled that back. The question I have now is, 
What difference would it make if the Fed actually cut 50, 75 basis points now? I mean, the markets are already pricing in through the way that they have uh, pricing bonds and their expectations are pricing in significant interest rate cuts between now and the end of the year. I'm not sure that it would make a huge difference because, I mean, one of the things you know that came out in that clip that we heard just now from uh, German Jay Powell, the notion that the Fed and everyone else seems to think that financial conditions right now are very restrictive as a result of interest rates where they are, but historically that isn't true. And if you look at the evidence of the asset prices that are only just now starting to come back into something near the stratosphere, um, (laughs) you know, from far, far distant orbit, you know, that doesn't suggest that, that monetary conditions have been unduly tight recently. So I think that a lot of this comes partly because markets are very reactive to monetary policy. It has always been thus. Um, That's one of the first cohorts of people and investors to benefit from interest rate cuts. And obviously, they want more if they think they can get it. But I do think that there also is this dawning realization that the Fed is the only game in town right now in terms of a willingness and ability to stimulate growth. Because correct me if I'm wrong, we have a presidential election in the U.S. in three months, and yet somehow we're spending all of our time talking about what the Federal Reserve chairman is going to do to stimulate the economy instead of looking at what either Kamala Harris or Donald Trump is promising to do to stimulate the economy. And so I think the investors know where help is going to come from if it's going to come. And they also seem to be figuring out where it is not going to come from. Well, the two presidential races are talking about who's the weirder person, not much about uh, substantive policy. So your point is well taken. But there is this issue of fiscal space, as it's called. I mean, we've got a deficit here, which is going to roll in about $1.7 trillion this fiscal year. And that's when we've had pretty good growth. There just is not a lot of room for any more spending. We have debt at 100% of GDP. That's the jet held by the public. It's expected to grow. You know, you'd like to see some better tax policy, and Donald Trump wants to cut taxes. Kamala Harris wants to raise them by three to five trillion, depending on how you want to count it. But Trump's first big tax policy, Mary, is proposals are one, don't tax tips. Second, don't tax Social Security benefits, which would combined cost about $2 trillion over 10 years, but not bring a lot of growth. Yeah, that's not the only problem with the Trump's plan for the economy. I mean, I think the bigger problem is that he's refusing to entertain any idea of reform of entitlements. And that's really the big problem that the U.S. government faces in the years to come. I mean, I would say, going back to your point about whether cuts will help, we agree that cuts are baked in the cake. But, you know, if they're baked in the cake and you don't go ahead and do them, I think the market would react very badly to that because they're so much expected. And now people are looking at earnings and whether people are going to keep their jobs and keep working and so forth. I agree with Joe that the economy is not terrible right now, but we do need a set of policies to deal with the entitlements problem and to make growth actually authentic as opposed to something that just comes from government spending. Or easy monetary policy. Well, we only have three months left before the election, and so we don't know what signals the economy and markets will send between now and then, but we do know that if there is a downturn, it does tend to hurt the incumbent party, although uh, challengers do have to make a case that might explain to voters what has been going wrong and what they can do about it. And that is something we haven't really heard from the Trump campaign. All right. So thank you, Mary. Thank you, Joe. We are here at Potomac Watch every day. We'll be following the twists and turns of the economy as well as of the wars in the Middle East and Ukraine and the presidential election race. Thanks for listening.